I'm Freya Olson. I'm a, a postdoc at Virginia Tech. I work with Quinn and Kaylin Carey here, uh, working on a range of different forecasting projects um, and have been leading on the aquatic theme of the forecasting challenge in the last year or so. Um, I have a background in lake ecology, which might pop up in the next hour or so as you see what we're going to be doing. Um, yeah, that's why Quinn, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Quinn Thomas, Associate Professor at Virginia Tech, um, and in the lead of the Ecological Forecasting Initiative Research Coordination Network, which is a National Science Foundation funded project to uh, grow the field of ecological forecasting by harnessing NEON data. And as part of that, we um, are hosting, we designed and are hosting the NEON Ecological Forecasting Challenge, which challenges you or anybody to submit your forecasts of NEON data before the data is collected. Um, and uh, and that's that's the foundation for the, um, the, the workshop we have here. All right, hopefully you can see presentation. No, so that's great. Okay, so can you predict the future? That's the eternal question, right? Um, today we're gonna just, I'm just gonna give you an overview of what we're gonna cover. I'm going to start off with some key concepts of ecological forecasting, make sure we're all on the same page. I'm going to introduce a bit more about NEON. Probably you all know what NEON is by now um, and the forecasting challenge. And then we're going to switch over to a walkthrough of a forecast workflow that uh, we've developed as like a tool and a framework to get you forecasting um, really quickly and give you the tools to, to, to enable you to submit your own forecasts. And then Towards the end of the workshop, I'm going to point you to a few more resources um, to find out more information about the challenge. If you're really interested in getting involved, um, how you can do that and some uh, resources to, to make that easier. As I said, we'll start off with an introductory presentation. I'm going to go through the R setup um, that was emailed out to you just in case anyone was having issues with that. And then we'll get on with the hands on coding. Um, or just feel free just to follow along if you don't want to do the coding specifically. Um, and then there'll be time for questions and time for you to um, have a go working with the code and modifying the, the model that we've given you. Feel free to interrupt with questions. I'm going to stop at specific points uh, for you to ask questions, but if you have a question about anything that I'm talking about or any code that I'm presenting, please feel free to interrupt by raising your hand or just shouting out. So why do we forecast? Many of us will have looked at the weather this morning. I know I did. It suddenly turned very cold in Blacksburg this morning and I wanted to know whether it was gonna rain and whether I need to bring my umbrella. Um, so small daily decisions like that are dependent on forecasts, but much larger decisions like how to manage extreme weather events or more recently in the summer, we had these uh, large air quality issues coming from the wildfires in Canada and forecasts of those types of things can help us make decisions about um, how to manage our uh, our lives and our ecosystems. And ecological forecasts, just like uh, meteorological and air quality forecasts can help us make those um, informative decisions. Today, we're gonna to be talking about near-term iterative ecological forecasts. And just to break that down, we're talking about Forecasts that are generated on the sub-daily to decadal timescale. So things that are uh, management relevant, we can make decisions on a timescale that we can then um, evaluate and uh, um, evaluate and update and make increasingly improved decisions, which brings us to the iterative part. This process of repeatedly validating, updating initial conditions or model parameters and issuing new forecasts every time data become available. So we're constantly collecting data um, and we can iteratively improve our models. Ecological forecasts, future, of prediction, future predictions of physical, chemical, or biological variables, and importantly, with quantified uncertainty. So the future is inherently uncertain, and quantifying how uncertain we are about those future conditions um, is really important. To give you some examples of what I'm talking about, um, you might have a forecast of dissolved oxygen concentration for the next one to 48 hours if you're planning to stock a river with fish for example you don't want them all suddenly dying if the oxygen concentration is going to rapidly drop you might produce a forecast of the percent chance of leaf fall to estimate when the optimal time is to go leaf peeping um, i can say it was probably about two weeks ago um, in virginia 
um, but potentially three months ago it would have been useful if you wanted to plan a trip. Or if you're planning on going hiking, you want to know what the potential tick abundance is going to be so that you can estimate the likelihood of interaction with these um, species. What this might look like graphically, we're co constantly collecting observations of these ecological variables. Um, and these can be shown on a time series like this. So these are past observations. And then we're going to use these observations to build a model and make a prediction of the future. Now you can see here this future prediction going out uh, seven days in this case, or seven hours, or whatever the time step is, has this band of uncertainty around it. We're, we're quantifying the uncertainty, and that's really important when we think about ecological forecasts. Ecological forecasting is still an emerging field and is rapidly growing. You can see this, uh, the number of forecasts being produced has exponentially increased in the last uh, 20 years. And we're continuing to uh, develop this field. Uh, it has lots of potential for both fundamental and applied questions when we think about ecology. Um, but there's still lots to learn about the predict predictability and the best, me best methods um, for this field. Also, forecasting is challenging. The endeavor of producing a real-time forecast is not an easy one, given the infrastructure needed to collect data, disseminate data, develop and deploy models, evaluate and distribute our forecast to end users. And there's the need to do this in a repeatable and reproducible way so that we can continue to produce new forecasts in this iterative cycle. In other fields like economics and computer science, uh, Competitions and challenges have been used as a way to push a field forward, and we've developed uh, this challenge as a way to catalyze the progress in ecological forecasting. We see this as an organizing principle for the community to get behind and develop a community of forecasting with common standards, uh, with the ability to develop tools and infrastructure that can be common across the field, and a challenge helps us develop a platform um, to start to do these things. It also helps us answer questions of predictability. If we can get lots of people forecasting the same data using lots of different models at lots of different sites, we can start to answer questions about how predictability varies across ranges uh, of different scales of models, sites, and variables. And NEON data is the perfect um, opportunity for this. Um, and then, the Neon Forecasting Challenge was born. So it's been going now for two full years um, with the goal uh, of the Research Coordination Network to lower the barrier, uh, build community and infrastructure and develop this platform for ecological forecasting. It's also helping Neon achieve its mission. So using data from across the 81 sites, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the data collected for forecasting um, is achieving the mission of NEON, which was initially set out in the early 2000s and includes forecasting as one of their key, key aims. So what is the challenge? As I said, and as Quinn said in his introduction, this is a platform for the community to make predictions of conditions at NEON sites before the data are collected. So this is a real-time forecasting challenge of the actual future. Um, we don't hold data back. We don't... Um, we don't have any competitive advantage by being the organizers. This is real future data that we're trying to predict. The data comes from all 81 neon sites, both terrestrial and aquatic, and we'll talk about that in a sec, and covers five different themes all, across all kind of levels of ecology, from uh, ticks and beetles, thinking about community and populations, um, leaf phenology, thinking about these phenological processes, and as well as covering terrestrial and aquatic sites from our terrestrial fluxes um, challenge through to the aquatic water quality, which we're gonna be looking at today. Just to reiterate, a forecast is a prediction of these future environmental conditions that includes quantified uncertainty. As an overview of how the challenge functions, we are using data from our ecological networks, NEON in this case, we're also collating numerical weather forecasts. A lot of our models that we use to make predictions also include weather covariates as some of the driving variables, and therefore having like a common um, weather forecast that teams can use in their forecasts um, gives kind of a 
a consistency across across teams. These are all made available to our forecasting teams who produce the forecasts and submit these to the forecast catalogue, where they are automatically evaluated every time new data become available. <clears throat> these scores are made available for teams to look at, both on our dashboard, as well as made available for them to do their own analyses. Another key part of the challenge is the, the training, such as like what I'm doing today, and many templates that have been developed to kind of really help people uh, get started uh, with, the, with their forecasting and get involved in the challenge. Um, if you're interested in like learning more in depth about the challenge and how it was developed, you can look at Quinn's uh, recent paper in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. And there's a link in the chat. And there's a link in the chat. Thank you, Quinn. Today, we're just going to be focusing on this little section of the challenge here, submitting a forecast. So don't worry about the rest of it for now. We're working on getting you submitting forecasts um, as soon as possible. OK, so I'm going to pause here for a second in case anyone has questions broadly about ecological forecasting or the challenge or the data. Um, feel free to shout out or put any questions in the chat. OK, I will continue for now. If you do have questions or you think of anything, feel free to, to put them in the chat when you think of them. So we're going to move on to the walkthrough, the hands-on part of the, of the webinar. Um, as I said in my introduction, we're going to be focusing today on the aquatics theme. Um, now, this is purely um, exam an example. Like The tools and the wor uh, workflow that I'm going to show you today will be applicable to any of the other themes. So if you have a real burning desire to forecast beetle populations, the tools I'm going to show you today will help you do that. We're using the aquatics data because it's good data. I'm a limnologist by training. It's interesting. But I promise you the tools that we're going to show you today are going to be applicable across, across the different themes. So why would we want to forecast aquatic um, environments anyway? Water temperatures are really important in many biogeochemical cycles for other water quality parameters, and they're important for um, thermal sensitive species in determining their habitat. So are we able to predict how water temperatures are going to change over the next month? That's the question that we're asking. We're going to be today focusing on water temperatures in, in the lake systems that NEON collect data in. Using this particular data product, if you're interested, you can go into the NEON a portal and have a look at about how the data are collected and things like that. We're going to be looking at the next 30 days as our forecast horizon is what it's called. So how how is water temperature going to change from now until the end of November? The data that are available as part of the challenge are a latency of two to three days. So that means that the data are available as part of the challenge just two to three days after they're collected, which is amazing. We have almost real time um, data about what is happening in our lakes. We're going to be using a very simple baseline model just to illustrate the workflow that is possible for ecological forecasting. Now, I'm not saying this is the best forecasting model for water temperature. It's probably not. Um, but that's the that's the challenge for you to come up with a better model than I'm going to show you today. Just to reiterate, NEON is an awesome um, data set to use in ecological forecasting and um, one of the reasons is because it has such a diversity of sites. So just within the lakes, we have uh, seven different sites across a, a range of eco domains. And you can actually, part of the challenge, we're looking for water temperature forecast across all aquatic sites. So how does our ability to forecast water temperature vary from our lakes to our rivers and streams? And NEON has the diversity of sites to help us answer those questions. The data that we're going to use today was collected using these automated uh, sensors, uh, which are um, in the middle of the lakes. Most of the year, you'll see some of the data, there's uh, gaps when they bring out the sensors when the lakes start to freeze. Um, but if you're interested in knowing more about how the data are collected and about the field sites that are included, um, you can go on the NEON website. There's lots of really in-depth information about that. Okay, so I want to get into some of the 
detail and this is mostly going to be because I'm probably going to use some of these words and I just want to make sure that um, we're all on the same page and we know what I'm talking about. So when I refer to targets, this is the thing that we're trying to forecast and also the thing that's going to be your forecast is going to be evaluated again. So in this case, our target is water temperature. And specifically for the lakes, now lakes have a depth and water temperature changes across that depth. But for the challenge specifically, we're looking for the temperature of the surface of the lake. So that is our target for today. The next important thing to think about is uncertainty. Forecasts are inherently uncertain and there needs to be some estimate of this in your forecast submission. You can represent uncertainty in a few different ways. You might represent this by doing multiple model runs. Um, so you can see this example on the right here, this middle um, plot. Um, we have multiple different potential iterations of future conditions, which gives an estimate of the uncertainty in our uh, future prediction. Another way to think about this is um, through a distribution. And if you know what the distribution of your forecast will be, um, you can report the statistics of that, whether it's, and that includes like the mean and the standard deviation, for example, if you had a normally distributed forecast. Today, we're also, as well as using NEON data, we're also going to be using data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, they produce weather forecasts um, across the globe, and uh, the NEON challenge organizers have been uh, uh, what's the word? <laughs> collating this data um, for the NEON sites to use um, as covariates in your model. So we have this consistent weather forecast data um, across teams. There are three data products available um, as weather forecasts. Um, and these have been, um, the challenge have developed a, an R uh, package to, to help you access these um, more easily. So the first two data products are our forecasts. So forecasts of uh, air temperature, relative humidity, wind speeds, things like that um, into the future. Uh, NOAA produces what we call an ensemble forecast. So these multiple iterations of future conditions, and there are 30 different ensemble members. We have our stage one, which is the raw forecast um, produced by NOAA. And then we have the stage two, which is a, a processed form of stage one, um, which has been interpolated to an hourly um, forecast. Then we have what we call stage three, which is what I like to term a historic data product. This is what we call a stacked data set, where we've taken the one day ahead from every previous forecast and stacked them together. So you can see here, we take the one day ahead from this first forecast in blue and stack it with all of the other um, one day ahead forecasts. One day ahead forecasts are very good and this gives a good estimation of observed conditions. So where you want to train and run your model using the same type of data, um, you can do this using the stage three and the stage two data. So the stage three is like a pseudo observation and is really useful for any model training or calibration that you want to do. Once you've submitted a forecast, this will go into our automated scoring pipeline um, and these produce scores, which is a means to test, means to assess your forecast skills. So we're evaluating the forecast against observations taken by, in this case, the sensors in the lakes. Uh, for the challenge, we use a scoring process called the continuous rank probability score. You don't need to know too much about how it works, but essentially because we're asking people to include estimates of uncertainty. Um, the scoring rule uses both the accuracy, so how good your mean prediction is, as well as the precision or the standard deviation of your forecast. So if you're very close to being correct, um, if your mean is very close to the observation, but you have a very wide uncertainty, you score less well than if your uncertainty was much narrower. And these scores are made available to users on our dashboard. Um, which hopefully Quinn will put in the chat. And um, so this is kind of what it looks like. So you can look at how your forecast has performed. You can look at other people's forecasts. You can see how close you were to observations, how well you perform on average. Um, and the scores are also available for you to look at um, 
locally if you want, if you want to grab those and do some evaluation yourself. Finally, we're going to talk a bit about um, standards. And as I said in the introduction, another reason for developing the challenge was to help give kind of a consistent terminology and uh, standardization across the field. Um, and specifically in these automated pipelines, we need to have a particular set of standard uh, uh, formatting um, to ensure that the automation works. So for example, you need to submit a forecast in a standardized file format. The file format needs to have a standardized name. Within that file, it has to have a specific structure with specific column names, um, which I will go through now. Um, so if you were going to produce a forecast, this is what it might look like. We have our target, so these historic observations of whatever it is you're trying to forecast. In this case, we have the temperature of the water, which is our variable. And then we're going to make predictions into the future. <clears throat> these predictions need to have some estimate of uncertainty. And in this case, we're representing our uh, representing our uncertainty using multiple different um, potential future trajectories. And we call these ensemble members. And the ensemble member is um, identified using its parameter number. So this would be parameter number one, parameter number two, et cetera. We also have this idea of a reference date time. So this dotted line here is the date that the forecast is being produced. So if this is a real-time forecast, that's going to be today. We're making a prediction today of the conditions tomorrow. And so the reference date time would be today's date. All of our forecasts also have an associated date time. So we're making a forecast of the 1st of um, November, for example. And if you've worked with Neon Data before, you'll recognize these four character codes, which all the sites have um, associated with them. So this is for Barco Lake, one of our um, Florida lakes. If you were going to imagine what this might look like in our standard format, um, in a CSV or a table, type format, it would look something like this. So we have the date that we're making the prediction of. That's a date in the past, so that is not correct. But the reference date time, if we're making a forecast, um, oh, I've got these columns the wrong way around. I'm really sorry. This, this red column is the reference date time. So this is the date that the forecast is being produced. And these are all being produced today. And this should be the date time. I'm going to have to go back and change my presentation. That's really annoying. Um, and your date time will go forward into the future. So you can see that the furthest ahead, we're making a forecast 30 days into the future, which would be the 30th of November. If the site that you're forecasting, so in this case, uh, Barco, um, the family and the parameter columns are two really important columns that describe the type of forecast that you're generating. So in this case, the type of forecast is an ensemble, which has these multiple trajectories of the future. And each of those trajectories is given um, a parameter value. So one to four representing our four different ensemble members. The variable that you're making a prediction of, um, in this case, is temperature, what the value of the prediction is for that particular time step, and the model ID um, for your team or your individual. So in order to make comparisons among models, we need to be able to differentiate them. And this is the model ID column to help us do that. So just to put this all together, what might a basic forecasting workflow look like? First, I would really encourage you, if you're interested in doing this, to read some of the documentation. The challenge organizers have done a really great job of putting together um, FAQs and help sheets to really get you started, understand more about the data, like where to get started um, and things like that. If you want to investigate the other themes and see how you might go about forecasting leaf phenology, you can have a look at uh, the documentation for that theme. Then ha have an inv investigate the, um, the data, the targets variables um, that you're interested in. So if you are interested in leaf phenology, have a look at the targets. What does the data look like? What kind of um, covariates might you want to include in the model or the forecast um, for the, your variable of interest? Then you want to build and apply your model. So if maybe you already have a model that forecasts leaf phenology and you've been using it um, already, but you want to put it into a forecasting mode, that would be your next step. 
then we want you to produce forecasts of future conditions um, and submit these to the challenge, which is what we're going to talk about today. The next step is to register. So part of the um, workflow um, requires you to register so that we know who's submitting forecasts, where you're from, why you're doing it, etc. Um, and some more information about the model that you're submitting so that we can do some kind of cross comparisons and evaluation um, within themes and across themes. Then wait for your scores to come in. So for water, the water quality variables, uh, as I said, we're looking at like a two to three day latency. So a forecast that you submit today will have been evaluated um, by the end of the week, which is really exciting. So if you're um, thinking about like the iterative process of, of updating your model in just two to three days, you can have more information about how you perform, update those model parameters and like make your model better every day. Which is says number seven, use the new data that comes in to update the model and submit another forecast. And this is um, a really important step, this iterative nature of forecasting. And one step that we're not gonna be able to cover today, but I will point you to some resources is this idea of workflow automation. You don't wanna be pressing go on your forecast every single day. And so, um, Using tools that enable you to automate the workflow that you've set up is really important. Okay, does anyone have any questions before we get into the next step? I can't see anyone. There we go. I also really like this cartoon. Um, Quinn, do you have anything to add? Did I miss anything? No. Nope. No. Okay. So before we move on completely, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a prime of what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at an R markdown document. Um, if you received the email class sent out last week, um, information on getting that document, but we'll go through it again in a second in case anyone missed it. I'm going to be using a really simple linear model to make forecasts of water temperature in the lakes using air temperature forecasts. So this is some um, air temperature and water temperature data from one of our sites. And you can see it's like roughly a linear fit. Um, so can we use predictions of air temperature to make predictions of water temperature? We're going to go through the whole workflow of like obtaining the data, fitting the model, and then generating the forecast. And then there's um, additional tasks to complete in that markdown, um, including modifying the model and submitting your own forecast. There's also some uh, tasks that you can complete, which take you through alternative model um, forecasting uh, approaches. Um, which we I'll talk briefly about, or if you're interested in forecasting different uh, variables, I can we can talk about that as well. Okay, so if you didn't have the instructions, um, you can click them here or scan the QR code, um, and then I will briefly I'll give you a, a minute or so to just navigate to that page if you haven't done already. Um, and then I can talk you through some of the uh, installation instructions. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing momentarily. Uh, th this is this is the link to the uh, GitHub repo for you. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Quinn. Okay, can you see the GitHub? Yes. Okay. Oh, also the meeting chat, there we go, let's get rid of that. Okay, so hopefully you have navigated here if you haven't got the code already. If you have, well done you, um, that's great. Anyone had any issues with any of the package installation? There's like one key package um, that you need the neon forecast package that's going to give you access to the NOAA weather data. 
that sometimes trips people up a little. Um, but if you didn't, that's okay. I'm going to talk you through it really quickly. And if you want to do this at a later time, if you just want to follow along, that's fine. You can navigate back to this at another time. And there's like step-by-step -step instructions about how to set up the R environment, how to get the code that we're going to run, um, and also some other options if you're familiar with Docker. If you're not, don't worry about that now. Um, so the first thing you probably want to do is open your R window, if you haven't done already. Your R Studio, I should say. Um, and then if you want to copy this um, installation instructions, we're going to be using mostly Tidyverse as our like base um, functional environment. There's some functions in Lubridate, which is a working with date times. Um, and then this is the Neon Forecast um, package, which installs directly from GitHub. And you'll need uh, this remotes package to install. And so if you just copy that and you can paste it, let me show you, paste it in your window and just click run. Um, I don't need to do that, mine are already up to date, um, but that's the first step. If you are not running our version 4.2, you won't be able to run the Neon Forecast package. So I would recommend updating to at least version 4.2 if you haven't done already. The next step, once you have the relevant um, packages installed, is to get the code that we're going to be running. Um, I'm going to talk you through the recommended um, function, um, option, which is to fork. If you're not familiar with GitHub, I'll give you an a second option in a second, but if you are, I would recommend forking the repository, which is to do that, you're gonna go up to um, the fork button. You see this one has a lot because I've done this a few times and you're gonna create a new fork. So I'll give you some options. You can change the name of the, the repository. This will give you the, the description that's already here. Um, I already have one, so it won't let me copy it. Um, and then you're going to click the big green button um, to create one. This is going to make a copy of what I have here in your personal organization. And hopefully you'll have all of these um, files and um, folders available to you. The next step is to clone. So we've forked and now we're going to clone. And again, you want to look for the big green button. Um, make sure it's on local. And you're going to copy this HTTPS link using this button here, which will tell you that it's been copied. Once you've copied it, go back over to your R window where you've just installed all of the packages. You're going to go to project at the top, click new project, which will be the first one on your list. Did that work? There we go. I'm going to use the version control option and it's going to clone a project from Git. And we're going to paste in that um, HTTPS link that we just copied. And this is going to generate a directory or a file, a folder, sorry, in your, um, in your local computer. And then you're going to click create project and it's going to bring all of those files from GitHub into your local R environment. Once you've done this and you clicked create project, it should look something like this. You should have Neon Forecast Challenge Workshop or whatever you decided to name your uh, directory, your project, sorry. Up in the top right hand corner, you should have all of the files from GitHub in here. This will probably not be open. It'll probably look like this. Um, and then to open that file that I just closed, we're going to be working through the submit forecast um, tutorial today. Do you want to open that? You probably won't have these files either. Don't worry about that. Um, and you want to open this one that's RMD, the R Markdown document. These will appear as we work through the, the materials. So don't worry about that for now. As long as you've got these two, and probably this one, that's fine. 
So anyone that's using GitHub and Git, hopefully you have this. If you don't have that, I'm going to go back to um, this. So if you're not familiar with GitHub, you've not used it before, you don't want to do it, that's absolutely fine. The other option is to click on the big green button again and instead download a zip file. This is going to download into your um, computer, wherever downloads go in your computer. Um, you're going to open that up and you want to um, extract or unzip all those files. And once they're extracted, you can see I did this yesterday. This is the same file. You can go into here and you want to open up this R project file. And that will then open up into your R window looking exactly like this. You should have Neon Forecast Challenge Workshop in the right corner. That's the project. And then again, you'll navigate to Submit Forecast and this R Markdown document. Does that, anyone have any questions about that setup so far? The one thing I should note, if you've done the um, the zip folder option, you won't be able to save any changes onto GitHub, what we call um, commits and pushes. You won't be able to do that, um, which might have issues later on, but it's not going to have any issues with you following uh, the, the markdown document um, initially. Um, and I, if anyone wants to do that later and has like struggled now, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to walk through uh, that with you again if, if you're interested. Okay, so this is the R markdown. The code is all there. It should all run, fingers crossed. Um, but I'm just going to talk you through each step, show you kind of a very simple forecast workflow that you can um, work through yourself, but also use um, and modify and you know personalize and make make your own, change the model, change the variables that you're interested in, and and I'll show you some tools to help you do that. So this is just pre-setup. You don't need to worry too much about that. Some background on the how this workshop came about initially. Some more information about um, packages you might need. If you're going to run this whole document, you'll need a few extra packages than the ones I initially um, told you about, but um, only if you're doing the later tasks. So don't worry about that uh, now. The ones we're going to need right now are this tidyverse and the lubridate um, function uh, packages. Sorry. So if you're not familiar with our markdown documents, the way that you run the code, um, this little green triangle on the right hand side of each, these are called code chunks, uh, will run every line in that chunk. So you're going to click go and it'll move everything into your console and run it. You can see here we loaded the tidyverse and the lubridate packages. It's also going to put any output in the console into your into this little window here, which you can then close. That's fine if, you, if it's getting in the way. So this information here is basically the introduction that I gave you in the presentation. So if you want to review any of the information that I gave you, most of it will be in here. Um, there's some more information about participation or signing up. Uh, there's lots of web links in here for you to navigate to the documentation part. Some information more about the challenge. So we're going to be working on water temperature today, but the challenge for this particular theme also covers oxygen and chlorophyll. And as I said, we're going to be working on the lakes, but if you're interested in rivers and streams, there's 27 of those. So you've got plenty of that to work with. And you can forecast any combination of these things that you want. So if you want to forecast oxygen in the 27 rivers and streams, that's great. If you just want to forecast chlorophyll in two of the rivers, that's also great. Maybe you want to work on the ones that are in your particular state. Um, that's great. Forecast whatever you like. Forecast them all. That would be great. Um, but if you have particular interests, then don't worry about forecasting everything if that's not what's interesting to you. We're looking in for the aquatics challenge specifically for daily forecasts. So we want daily predictions at least 30 days into the future. You can make longer predictions if you like, but at least 30 days. 
and we take new submissions every day. So we'll submit a forecast today, but if you want to update your model and submit another forecast tomorrow, maybe a new data comes in, you update the parameters slightly, submit a new forecast the day after, that's, that's great. Today we're going to focus on the lake sites, as I said, and we're going to start with water temperature. Um, some of the submission requirements, spelling error, um, we talked about in the introduction, the, this idea of the, sta the standards and submitting things that are in a particular format. There's more information about it here. I will talk about that as we get to that stage of the submission process. Okay, so here we are, the forecasting workflow. So the first step, we need to know what we're forecasting and we need to know um, what that data looks like. So the first step is reading in the data, uh, looking at this historic data or the targets as I introduced in the, in the presentation. And these data are available with a latency of like a two days, let's say, usually. And these have been uh, cleaned and compiled and kind of standardized across uh, time steps and things like that to generate our targets, which are then available from the FE server. So these are on a, a uh, what's the word? Uh, the CSV link never changes. So you can consistently look for the aquatics targets at this um, location. This dot GZ um, is just a compressed CSV. So it's just to keep the file size a bit more manageable on the FE server. So don't worry about that. But you can read in this CSV just using the regular read CSV um, function here. So we're going to click the green button. It's going to read it in. It's going to put it into our environment. We can see here that we have 173,000 observations across three different variables. So the next thing we might want, as well as our targets, is to know what sites we're forecasting. So I told you already that we're going to be forecasting the lake sites, but you guys might not know where those sites are or what kind of systems they are. So we can also look for information about the sites. And this has been compiled on, this happens to be a GitHub um, link, but again, it's just a, a CSV um, that you can read in. We're just interested in the aquatic site. So we'll filter that for where aquatics equals one or true. So these are ones and zeros, whether it's aquatics, terrestrial, phenology, beetles, ticks. Um, it tells you which theme the site is uh, present for. So again, we're going to read that in, and it'll put it into our environment. And we can have a look in a second. So what do the targets data look like? If you run this one here, it's going to give you 10 of those lines. And you can see that we have very similar column names to the ones I showed you for. They're exactly the same column names, I should say, as the ones for the forecast that you're going to produce. So it has a date time. It has this four character site ID. It has the variable which the observation is for, so in this case, uh, oxygen and chlorophyll. And it has the value of that observation. And you can see some of these are NAs, um, but we have um, observations all the way back to 2017. Um, yeah, that's what the data look like. And then the uh, site information, if you're interested in learning more about the sites before you start forecasting them, Maybe you want to look at sites in a particular state or a particular latitude. Um, this um, CSV is a really good place to start. So it has the site IDs that are associated to the, the full names, um, which uh, challenge they appear in, which theme. So I just looked at the aquatics ones, which is why we just have aquatics ones. Um, what type of site it is. So we're looking for lakes but we also have wadeable streams and non-wadeable rivers. And you can read more about that on the, the NEON website to learn more about how these sites differ. Uh, some information, you can look for the, their website, uh, information about access, uh, what domain they are in, their latitude, longitude, all kinds of information um, that might be helpful when you're thinking about forecasts. The next step that you probably will want to do is to visualize the data. We want to, it's a good idea to have a look at what the data look like. 
rather than just looking at a giant table of 173,000 rows. That's not very easy to, to understand. So uh, this little code chunk here is just going to change that into a, those scatter plots that we saw in the presentation to get an idea of what the data look like historically. So we're making a plot of temperature, oxygen, and chlorophyll. I'm trying to close this window. Okay. So we've generated um, three plots here. Oh, I missed a, I missed a, I missed a chunk. Okay, sorry. What we're also going to do is filter our sites by subtype. So we're just looking at the lakes, and we're going to do the same thing for our targets. That's why it took a little bit of time. Forgot this bit. Um, we're going to take just the the target data from our lake sites. So that's going to make our target um, data frame a little bit more manageable um, for this particular uh, workshop. So we're looking at 25,000 rows. And again, we can plot it. And it's going to generate those three plots, now just looking at our seven uh, lake sites. So we have chlorophyll data, oxygen data, and temperature data. So if I just minimize this, um, you can see here we have different um, durations of data. So some uh, data observations start in around 2017. Some don't start until mid 2018. And uh, to, uh, Prairie Lake, the observations don't start until um, mid 2019. And also, it's worth noting for the lake sites um, that the majority, five out of the seven sites, their sensors get removed in the winter period because of ice cover. And so we have these gaps in the winter. Uh, where the sensors are removed. The only lakes that sensors remain in are Barco Lake and Suggs Lake, which are both in Florida and do not suffer from ice cover. So this is kind of a good place to start, looking at the data, thinking about how the sites differ, what kind of covariates you might want to use to make predictions of these variables. So again, I, we have temperature. We also have observations of oxygen. If you're interested in making oxygen forecasts, having a dig into what the oxygen data look like, when is it available, when is it not available, what are the fluctuations like, and the same for chlorophyll A. And just to reiterate, these um, observations, these targets, are just from the surface of the lakes. But today we're going to focus on temperature as a starting point. So we done our visualizations, the next step is to think about what types of models it might be, use, might be useful to make predictions of these for the future. So one way that you might think about this is to think about what is happening in the system right now. Usually a good predictor of what's going to happen tomorrow is what's happening today. And a model such as a persistence, which says that tomorrow is going to be the exact same as today, is a useful place to start. And if you're interested in these types of persistence models, um, there's some information about those, um, it's model two in this document. Another way to look at it might be to think about how a variable has a relationship with another forecasted variable. So how does information about what might happen to air temperature tell us about what's going to happen to water temperature? And this type of model would use air temperature as a covariate, uh, which is what we're going to think about today. And finally, you might want to think about what the historic data tells us about what is normal for this time of year. So likely October, November time last year is it's going to be similar to what it's going to be like this year. So using um, the historic data or what we call a climatology model is another useful part, um, another useful information uh, for making forecasts. And if you're interested in those types of models, uh, model three on this document, um, if you're interested in climatology or sometimes termed seasonal and naive models. But today in this um, little workshop, we're just gonna focus on a model, a linear model with covariates. And we're just interested in temperature. So I'm gonna filter out the rest of the oxygen and the chlorophyll data and just focus on those temperature targets. So again, our targets um, data frame here has been 
uh, reduced down to 8,000 rows across our seven different sites, which is still a good amount of data for us to work with. So these covariates that we want to use in our um, model, where might we get these from? Now, helpfully, the challenge organizers have um, already um, started to comp compile a lot of this data and to make it available and really uh, reduce that as one of the barriers uh, for producing forecasts. As I said in the introduction, there's these three different data products, stage one, stage two, which are forecasts of weather, and then stage three, which is this estimate of historical weather or kind of pseudo observations. We're going to focus on just using the stage two and the stage three data today. And we're going to use functions from that NEON forecast package. So if you had any issues installing that package, um, you might not be able to do this section. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk through it and you can follow along if you have issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate this um, air use, we're going to generate a forecast of water temperature using air temperature as a covariate. So we're going to access some NOAA air temperature forecasts and some NOAA air temperature historic observations to generate and calibrate a model and then um, run the, the forecast into the future. So the first step we need is some historic weather data that we can match with our historic water temperature data. And so to do this, we're going to use the NEON forecast um, package. And inside that package, these two dots mean use this function from this package. So we're going to use the function NOAA underscore stage three. And we're going to assign that to uh, this object here. If you want to go ahead and run this, depending on your internet connection, um, it, whoa, oh, that's not fun. Hmm. This run when I ran it 20 minutes ago. Quinn, any ideas? Uh... I've never seen that error before. Uh, try restarting. Hmm. Sorry about this, guys. This 100% worked when I ran it an hour ago. Okay, let's uh, rerun all of the previous chunks. Hmm. Okay. I think I have a work around. Give me one second. Is there something on the back end that's not? No, but uh, another uh, S3 bucket um, that we have, folks were having issues yesterday that, that I couldn't figure out either. So 
but you got it working an hour ago, so I don't know. It worked perfectly. And it looks like at least a couple of the participants it's working for. Oh, so, yeah, well, it just worked. Okay. It just worked for me. Okay. Um, do you want to share your screen, Quinn? Uh, sure. I uh, keep keep talking through. Okay. So essentially what this is doing, hopefully you guys have got it working. Um, I'm glad it's not, it's just me and not everyone else. That would be a worse way around. Um, it's going to create a connection to this S3 bucket where the data is stored. And instead of um, bringing in all of the weather forecast data for all of the sites, so we currently we have 81 neon sites and there's like seven or eight different um, weather variables that you can get information about. Instead of bringing all of that data locally in like one big chunk and then you having to filter it, what it's going to do is create a connection to this remote um, bucket um, or database and allow you to filter remotely before bringing the data that you need into your local environment. So in this case, it's going to connect to that stage three data, that historic data product. Then we're going to generate um, this vector of the variables that we're interested in. So if you want additional variables, maybe in there you'll also put like relative humidity or wind speed. Uh, you can find out what other variables are available here. Um, and then we're going to filter this connection uh, based on this uh, vector of variables as well as the sites that we're interested in. So in this case, it's just the lake sites. We're just interested in air temperature and we only want um, historical observations since we started collecting data uh, at NEON. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna filter and then the final step in order to bring it locally. So you've queried that database and then the final step is to use this function collect from dplyr. That's going to put it into your um, global environment. I won't be able to run that function because I, I don't have this particular object. Um, but if you did, you should generate a data frame which has uh, columns with date time, uh, the variable ID, the variable uh, name, the site ID, uh, and the uh, prediction. Uh, Frey, if you let me share share my screen, have it pulled up. Okay. You can talk. I can just scan. Can I request your? There you go. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Okay. So this is what the um, forecast is going to look like. Uh, as I said, we have date, time, the site ID, some information about where the forecast is from. This same column names that uh, I showed you in the in the introduction. Uh, that you need to submit a forecast that are also present in our NOAA forecast. So we have this idea of an ensemble. Um, so the weather forecast that's produced by NOAA is also an ensemble forecast, but it has these multiple potential future um, scenarios. Um, where the prediction was um, taken from, so it's like a standard two meters above the ground height for weather data. And then the prediction. So you can see here, for, this is an air temperature. This is in Kelvin, which is like the standard SI unit of temperature. And you may or may not want to work in Kelvin. You may want to work in uh, Celsius. So which is what we're going to do. So the next step is to take this uh, ensemble prediction. And we just want like a single line time series that we can match with our water temperatures to generate the model. So what we're going to do is, um, uh, this is some aggregation. So instead of having this ensemble with the multiple different parameter values, we're just going to have one mean prediction. So we're going to uh, group by date, site, and variable and generate a mean prediction, which is what happens. Yeah, this is crazy that I can control, control your computer from my computer. But anyway, there we go. Um, and so this is going to produce this past mean, which will be now in your uh, environment up here. And instead of having lots of different columns, we now just have three, which have 
a date time, a site ID, and then a column called air temperature, which was produced when we did this pivot here. So we've taken it from a long format to slightly wider where we just have one column for air temperature. The next part of the data that we're going to need is the stage two. So we'll use stage three to fit our model, and then we're going to use stage two to run it into the future. So we do the same type of uh, data manipulation and um, accessing of the S3 bucket. Um, we're going to need a few other um, vectors. So the first one is the date. And if you're making real-time forecasts, the date that you're making the forecast is today, hopefully. Um, one thing to note is that the NOAA data is only available the day after the, for the forecast date because it takes so long to run, it only becomes available the day after. So if you want to make a forecast today, you can't use today's weather forecast. You have to use yesterday's weather forecast and run it into the future. So we're going to take the day before today as our NOAA date, the date of the NOAA forecast. And again, we're going to use this uh, neon forecast package and this this time the stage two um, function. And we're going to use the argument start date um, to collect the NOAA forecast from a particular date. So we want the date um, the forecast generated yesterday, which we assign here. We again just want air temperature. And we're going to use the same type of syntax um, to filter the connection that we've generated um, in this line to, on 209. And we're going to filter by the date, the site ID, and the variables of interest. And again, the final step is to collect. And hopefully this will have um, also come into your um, environment. You can see this is quite a large data frame because we have, to reiterate again, that the NOAA forecast is this ensemble. So we have for every date and every site, we have 31 different iterations of the future. We're interested for the, the challenge to make daily predictions of water temperature. So we need daily predictions of air temperature to make our water temperature predictions. And so we're going to do a bit more data wrangling just to get in the format that we need. We're going to take that large data frame, which has um, all these different um, columns, sorry, uh, the predictions, the, the variable of interest, the reference date time, so the date the forecast was generated, which you can see is yesterday, which is what I specified um, the, the NOAA forecast that I wanted. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create into a date time so that we can wrangle it a little easier. We're going to group by date time, site ID, parameter and variable. And what this is going to do is it's going to retain those individual ensemble members so that we can maintain the uncertainty in our air temperature forecast that we can then um, move into our water temperature forecast. So it's going to make that mean prediction um, from the hourly down to the daily. Um, it's going to do that pivot again. And then a little bit more mutation, we're going to convert it from Kelvin again into Celsius. Did I run this already? I don't remember. I'm going to click it again. And it's going to generate this data frame with a, a future weather forecast at a daily time step with 31 different ensemble members for every date. So you can see that the forecast yesterday produced of today has 30 different ensemble members that vary in their prediction of air temperature from kind of 21 up to like 23 and a half. And so you can see that there's, there's uncertainty in, in what the air temperature is going to be. Now we have our future weather and we have our historic weather, we can start to um, build our model. It's a good idea to uh, visualize the data again, just to check what it looks like. So you can see here we have the blue line is our historic observations and the black is our ensemble prediction of the future. So we have this um, uncertainty, this cone of uncertainty increasing as we go further into the future. The next step is to build our model. Um, so we want to use our target water temperatures and our historic air temperatures and generate a linear model between these two covariates. What I'm doing here in this uh, code chunk is just kind of uh, making it, and you don't need to do this step, but just getting all the data in one place, I just feel like it's easier to look at. So you can see for every date we have 
a water temperature and an air temperature and can we make a model that fits these one against the other which is what we're going to do to do this we're just going to use the base r lm function um, but there are lots of different methods to fit linear and non-linear non models um, in r one way one package that's really i found really useful is this fable package um, which is specifically for forecasting there's a a linear model function called TSLM, time series linear model. Um, but there's lots of different uh, forecasting approaches in there. And I would recommend looking at this documentation if you're interested in these regression type functions. We're going to start off just forecasting one site just to show you what the process is, and then I'll show you the next step. So we're going to start off with Suggs Lake, one of our Florida lakes, lots of data, um, lots of uh, yeah, we should be able to fit a model nice and easily between our water temperatures and our air temperatures. So we're going to forecast SUGS. We're going to filter just to get targets data for SUGS Lake. We're going to do the same thing for our uh, future data. And then we're going to fit the model. So we're using the LM function. And then we have our uh, dependent variable um, by our independent variable. And that's just going to fit a linear model between those two. Um, variables and then from this model so this generates a linear model with uh, two different um, parameters it has an intercept like a straight line has an intercept and a gradient and so this is the intercept at negative eight and our gradient of around 1.5 and so we can use those two coefficients to um, estimate our water temperatures so we take the intercept is the first coefficient here and we add it to the product of uh, the second coefficient and the air temperature, which we take from our future NOAA data that we uh, grabbed earlier. And from there, it's going to produce a load of water temperatures that look like that, which is not super helpful to look at. And so we'll put that into a nice table in a second. Now, if we wanted to do that for every site, you could copy and paste that code. You could make it into a function if you wanted. Um, but what I'm going to show you is just a really simple for loop where we take every single site. So for each of our sites, we're going to do the exact same thing that I just showed you and fit the model, um, generate the water temperatures. And then here, we're just going to put it all into a nice little uh, tibble or data frame with the date time, the site ID, um, the parameter value, that ensemble number, the predicted water temperatures, which we generated using the linear model and then give it a variable name. We're going to bind it all together using this bind rows function and then it'll just tell us that it's done. So if we click go on that one, you can see it ran through each one, it fitted the model and generated the um, data frame. So now we have all of these different potential future uh, iterations of water temperature based on our air temperature prediction. And here it is. So you can also expand this window using this little one here um, if you want. But you can see that this is similar to the uh, figure that I showed you in the presentation where we have past observations. We have this idea of a reference date time, which is the date that the forecast was generated. Our prediction of water temperature based on those air temperature predictions. The date time for that prediction. The value of the, the forecast and each of the individual sites are shown differently. So you can see here that potentially in the next like 10 days, it's going to get a little warmer at Barco and then it's going to, it gets quite uncertain about what the water temperature is going to be. You see the sites are all like slightly different. So there we have it. We have a forecast of water temperature. Um, the next step is to make sure that it's in a format that is, um, in this standard standardized way so that we can enter the automated pipeline um, and just retains consistency across forecasts essentially so we have a date time this idea of reference date time when the forecast was generated the site id the type of forecast that you're submitting so for this one we've used the ensemble members from NOAA to produce a, an ensemble forecast of water temperature the ID value for each of those ensemble numbers given by the parameter value. 
what the variable is that you're predicting, the value of that prediction, and then you need to give it a model ID. So the model ID that for this example is example ID. If you go ahead and make uh, modifications to the model or you decide to submit your own model, you'll need to give it a different ID so that we can differentiate uh, the examples from actual submitted forecasts. And you'll also need to register. So we're going to take the um, forecast that we generated. We're going to do some slight mutations, just um, get it in the FE format. And then the last step, now we have a nice, where's the, this one, the FE format. We have a, a data frame that looks like the one I showed you in the presentation, the date time, the reference date time, site ID, family, blah, blah, blah. All nice and tidy, ready to go. We need to submit it. And again, the challenge organizers have included a function in the Neon Forecast package to help you do this. Um, there's a couple of functions that will help you in your submission step. The first one that I like to point out is this forecast output validator. This is really helpful when you're first starting out to check that you've got it in the right format. Um, it'll take your file, it'll check you've got the right um, file name, the right um, column IDs, and if you haven't, it'll tell you where you've gone wrong and you can uh, make changes to, to improve that. Then we're going to use the submit function, and that's going to take your local file and it's going to put it into the S3 bucket where it will get evaluated automatically. So the first thing we need to do is save the file. Currently, it's just in our RStudio window. It's not anywhere else. Um, the file name has to be in a standardized format. The first thing you need is the theme. So we're submitting for the aquatics theme. The next. Uh, thing is for the date. So this is the reference date time, the date of the forecast generation. Uh, we're going to paste these together into a CSV. And did that run? I don't know. This one. This one. So now we have a file that was an aquatics forecast that was generated today with an I a model ID of example ID. And we're saving it as a CSV. Nice and easy. I like to save my forecast into a forecast file. That'll generate a little directory here just to keep them all organized away from your markdown documents. We're gonna write it into that forecast um, directory. We can have a look in here. There it is. And then use the validator function to check that all of the things are correct. So as I said, it's gonna look that your file name is correct, the, va the variables, that you've said are in there or in there. Um, does it have a reference date time or not? Yes. And if it comes up true, that means you did a good job. Um, the forecast is valid and you can continue to the submission step. So the final step is this submit again within the Neon Forecast package. And there's a uh, one argument I just want to point out in this. So you need the forecast file. Where is that file? It's right here to make sure you um, specify in the right place. Then there's this ask um, argument. If you set that to true, um, it will generate, I don't know if what Quinn's got set up here, but it'll generate a little pop-up or this little question at the bottom. Do you want to submit this forecast? Are you sure? Yes, so you really want to submit the forecast. And so, which is really helpful when you're um, starting out, you want to make sure that yes, it did get submitted or not. But if um, you're setting up an automated workflow, you don't want to have to click yes every time. So you can set this to false. And it will not submit your forecast. Quinn, what have you got set up here? <laughs> I think Quinn has some AWS. Uh, I have a different set of credentials. Yeah. I have conflicting things on my computer. Yeah. But if you have no other um, S3 bucket um, credential issues, that should all say yes. It says it's the right format. You've done everything correctly. Um, you just have your credentials not correct. But hopefully you've managed to get through to that step. Um, so thinking about like next steps and how you can move forward with forecasting, 
is this linear model any good? Do we think that making using air temperature to predict water temperature is the best way to make predictions of water temperature? Maybe you have a process model that also uses um, solar radiation or wind speed to induce mixing or things like that. Maybe a machine learning algorithm that takes like the last seven days and fits some kind of, I don't know, general additive model over it or some kind of black box model is going to be better. So just to kind of illustrate this, this is the bit between those two variables. So for some, maybe it's doing a good job up here, but there's still quite a lot of spread around that line. Maybe you can use the uncertainty from this model fit to, in, to in, increase your uncertainty estimation. So there's like lots of ways that you can think about modifying the model that we've given you um, or improving it really um, to make better predictions of water temperature. So there's some tasks included here. Maybe you want to include additional NOAA variables in your linear model. Maybe you want to induce a nonlinear relationship between these variables. Um, trying to forecast oxygen or chlorophyll in addition to or instead of uh, water temperature. Maybe you could use your water temperature forecast to make a prediction of dissolved oxygen. Or maybe you want to include a lag in the predictors. So maybe yesterday's air temperature is a better predictor of today's water temperature rather than um, today's air temperature. So just some ideas to get you started. Um, and if you do make substantial changes to the model and you want to continue to submit uh, forecasts, remember to change the model ID. So information here about registration, but you don't need to worry about that just yet. If you do have questions about that, please feel free to email me. Um, I'd be happy to talk you through the, the registration process or if you're in, interested in submitting a different model but you're not really sure where to get um, get started I can I can help you with that and if you are interested in learning more about forecasting approaches um, as I said the fable package is a really great um, resource they've done a really good job of putting together the information and they've got a really nice like online textbook that I really liked when I was starting out with this um, so if you want to learn more about persistence forecasting or the climatology forecasting, there's, again, step-by-step -step, um, instructions about generating those forecasts. There's a couple of additional packages that you'll need, um, including the Fable package, um, but that's all available for you in this markdown. Um, I think that's everything. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Uh, Queries, did someone's thing not work? Does anyone need troubleshooting? That sounds really aggressive. That's not what I meant. Um, but if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand um, or email me at a later date. Let me get back. Can you put the, can I put my presentation up? I can show you my email address. Um, yeah. Let's go with this one. So yeah, you can email me here. Um, have a look at the Eco Forecast website um, to learn more about EFI, the Ecological Forecasting Initiative. The neonforecast.org has all of the documentation about the challenge if you want to learn more about the other themes. So the tools that I've shown you today um, about like accessing NOAA data and accessing the, the um, targets files are all going to be the same depending, depending on which um, challenge you do. Um, Big shout out to Quinn and Carl, who've like all of the cyber infrastructure they've developed to make this possible. Um, and yeah, please feel free to email me if you have questions or want to get involved.